So the Puritan John Stubb wrote a book that was critical of Queen Elizabeth I's proposed marriage to a Catholic. He got arrested, his hand was cut off, and with his left hand, he raised his hat and cried, God save the Queen! Welcome to Doubts Aloud. Well, welcome back, Steve, our resident, well, not resident, but getting there, historian for church history. That's a fascinating story. John Stubb. <laughs> So he was already called Stubb before he yeah. had his hand cut off. <laughs> Is that like um, art following history or history following art? Yeah. Oh, Steve, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, and uh, of course, you're a comedian as well as a church historian and um, a, an editor, all sorts. What sort of launched this? Is your book, um, The Journey to the Mayflower? Uh, which you wrote um, a couple of years ago. And um, an uh, uh, aspect that uh, I thought would be really good would be to talk about uh, just theological discussion um, and how it's been conducted through church history, and particularly uh, the history that you were uh, covering in the book, which was, um, of course, uh, up to the, launch, the journey of the Mayflower, <clears throat> which was 1620, and I guess your story starts in about um, 15, late 1550s when yeah. Queen Elizabeth took to the throne. Yes. Uh, well, we really start with the burnings of Protestants under um, Queen Mary, her predecessor, just uh, a few years earlier. That was, you know, the height of religious debate, if you like, um, not so much by argument, but by execution. So could, could, before we get stuck into the details, um, could you give us a little bit of sweep of history? This discussion is, is taking part. Um, so it's like the context of the discussions. Certainly. So we're in the Reformation period. Um, Martin Luther has created Protestant Christianity by his by his independent thinking and his refusal to submit his independent thinking to the authority of the church. And although other heresies have sprung up throughout the Middle Ages, this is one which uh, ends up dividing Europe because uh, it isn't stamped out by the church. Uh, and it happens at a time when nation states are developing and different states go different directions with the new religion. And while this is happening we, in England, Henry VIII uh, was a devout Catholic who wrote books against Martin Luther, uh, but for purely political reasons, he found that uh, he had to throw off the authority of Rome so that he could get rid of his wife and marry a new one. And the Pope wouldn't let him do that. And so um, without embracing Protestantism, Henry took the Church of England away from Rome and Parliament declared him the supreme head of the Church of England. So you've got an independent Church of England. Uh, so him, that was like um, sort of the, the first Brexit. Yes, yes, yes. You've got a, a European... Uh, fellowship of Catholicism and um, England was one of the countries that flew away from it. Um, uh, Henry's son Edward, Edward VI, was um, uh, an actual Protestant and so under his young and short rule the Church of England became a proper Protestant church and it was reformed and the liturgy was changed and everything that happened in church changed and things that ministers war changed and became properly Protestant but he he died young and his sister so yeah his sister Mary became queen and she was an ardent Catholic who had been and disinherited when Henry divorced her mother. And so she had a passion for restoring Catholicism and rooting out the dangerous and pernicious error of Protestantism, which ended up with her burning 300 English Protestants. But she also died before she was able to root out uh, Protestantism from England. And that's when Elizabeth became the queen. And she was, well, she was a Protestant. She was a, a, a thorough Protestant. She had to be because her mother was Anne Boleyn, uh, who Henry had got rid of the Church of Rome so that he could uh, uh, divorce his previous wife and marry Anne, marry Anne Boleyn. So under Catholicism, Anne Boleyn wasn't a proper queen. And so therefore her daughter, Elizabeth, 
um, was a bastard and, and couldn't inherit the throne. So Eng Elizabeth happened to be a Protestant in order to inherit the throne. So she was completely convinced by Protestantism. But she also liked quite a few of the traditions of Catholicism, uh, the, the outward uh, visual aspects of it in particular. Uh, and she insisted on having a thorough Protestant reformation again of the church, but it was more backward looking than a lot of people were expecting, a lot, much more backward looking than her brother Edwards had been. Um, and the flashpoint was that Elizabeth insisted that her Protestant ministers don't don't wear plain clothes like Protestant ministers did in other countries, but they had to wear the traditional Catholic robes that she liked so much. Um, and this was hugely controversial. No Protestants uh, like these Catholic traditions, especially not English Protestants who had lived through the burnings under Queen Mary and had been, you know, um, had been radicalized by that English society had been really divided by that experience um, and so it was appalling horrible to them that ministers in the Church of England were dressing in these robes um, and so that's where you get the Puritan movement from um, you, Elizabeth had a, a Protestant state church uh, done exactly how she wanted it um, and no Protestant wanted it like that but a lot of Protestants for the sake of their godly queen accepted the Church of England as she had designed it and they put up with it um, but there were those who insisted that the church had to change and campaigned to change the church um, the campaign to purify the Church of England and that's why we call them Puritans. At the time, they were called precisions because they wanted the church to be precisely as it is in the Bible. Uh, and so that was the great division. Well, there was uh, there were other great divisions in Elizabeth England because there was a division between Catholic and Protestant as well. There were still some people who were attached to Roman Catholicism. But within English Protestantism, there was this great division between those who accepted the Elizabethan Church of England and the Protestants who uh, the Puritans who were campaigning for further reformation in a more Protestant direction. Uh, what was the sort of balance of numbers between these two groups? It's it's not entirely clear. You know, uh, records are too patchy to say. I think that when Elizabeth came to the throne, a majority of people would have uh, been quite happy for Catholicism to stay. Um, a lot of people would just go whichever way the wind blows as well. Um, so uh, Protestants, I think, were probably still in a, a minority when Elizabeth came to the throne uh, nationwide. But in London and in the southeast, which was obviously the seat of power, there was a much higher concentration of Protestants. Um, and London was the, you know, the hotbed of Puritanism. But it, uh, from the book, I remember it's only a few hundred uh, here and a few hundred there in a population of maybe a couple of million or something? Um, of, of Protestants. Um, uh, of Protestants of, uh, of the, the Puritan. Puritan style who were, who were prepared to risk life and limb for their beliefs. Um, I, I, so um, it, was, it was under Mary that um, the Protestants were really risking their life and it was much easier to be a Protestant under Elizabeth. So um, although I, I wouldn't want to put a number on it, I think the number of Protestants was was much larger under Elizabeth and she was queen for 25 years. And so uh, Protestantism grew and grew and grew and uh, Catholicism dwindled throughout that time. So yeah. Uh, a much yeah. smaller proportion. Yeah. And now, why, why were some people so... Um, wedded to Catholicism, um, whereas even to the point that, that they would be executed for it, whereas others sort of fell into step. Was there kind of a general view that um, these things weren't that important and you just, you know, it was the business, you know, you had to be a loyal subject or, or do you think there was something particularly persuasive at the time about Protestantism? Well, Certainly at the time, people took religion very seriously indeed. And uh, yeah, so far as we can tell, they believed it very 
uh, authentically um, and and honestly, and you know, um, more or less everyone was a Christian of one kind or another, and that was the culture that people lived in, and that was their understanding of the world. And so, um, because all Christians believed that at that point of time, all Christians believed that their brand of Christianity was the one that would get you to eternal life, then for that reason, it was very important that you that you chose the right church and that you stayed with it, even if it meant being persecuted. There were, certainly there were people who were willing to give up their faith to avoid persecution. But also there's there's some sort of identity there as well, isn't there? That um, So you can see um, that there was a class divide between Catholicism and Protestantism. You know, there was a lot of attachment to Catholicism among the, the aristocracy. Um, so that was a kind of a badge of identity. Protestantism belonged much more to the rising middle classes. And, you know, also... Protestantism was the kind of the, the religion of the metropolitan elite, as we'd call it these days, you know, those London Puritans. Uh, right, like Remainers, you mean? <laughs> yes. Mm, I was yeah. thinking that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Whereas mm. if, you, if you go out to towns and villages in Lancashire and Yorkshire, you, you would find much more deep rooted attachment to the traditional ways and, um, and contempt for whatever was going on in London. Mm. Yeah. I think there's something else that that struck me from the book or from you talking about this. Um, and that is uh, people obviously believe that their version of Christianity is the absolute right one. Yeah. But they also believe that if the whole country doesn't follow it, the whole country is in sort of trouble with God or it's it's mm. just important not just for each individual to believe the right stuff, but the whole country should believe the right thing. Yes, absolutely. For as long, well, much longer than anyone could remember, for a thousand years, what Christianity, what the church had meant in Europe was not um, an individual choice, not an individual way of life, but it was the way that um, the whole of society was run. The, the church was a, a Christian nation um, and it was you know, deeply assumed to be essential that everyone believed the same thing, otherwise society would collapse. I mean, the, I, I think an analogy that I give in, in the book is that today we assume it's essential that the law, <laughs> uh, this is interesting considering the, <laughs> the times we're living through, the law must apply to everybody equally. <laughs> Um, whatever their class, whatever their colour, mm. whatever their role in society. The no one... rave up parties then. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the, the one law has to apply to everybody. Yeah. And, and if people could make up their own laws or decide which laws they're going to follow, then the rule of law would be over and society would collapse. And we're hoping yeah. to avoid that at the moment. Um, and, and, and that was how people thought about the Christian church, that uh, there must be one religion holding the whole country together and if individuals decide what the faith is going to be then the, you know then society would collapse not least because um at the time the church was an arm of government it wasn't just a matter of belief but when the spanish armada in 1588 was attacking england uh, Elizabeth responded by sending the message out through the church, through her bishops, to get every local vicar to, uh, you know, to preach about this, but also to raise armies uh, so that each you know, parish would be arming itself to fight against the, the Spanish invasion. So it was essential you know, politically for Elizabeth to control her church and make sure that everyone was part of the same church. Um, you know, not just for spiritual reasons, but because, you know, religion and politics were in some ways very much the same thing. And mm. presumably uh, for the reasons you've identified, uh, Catholics posed a real danger to Elizabeth or could certainly be seen as posing a real danger because um, they their view would have been that she was not the 
proper queen. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and they were also seen to have loyalties to a king outside of England because their ultimate uh, leader was the, the Pope. Um, and the Pope told them that their ultimate loyalty was to him, not to Elizabeth. And in fact, the, the Pope declared Elizabeth deposed, uh, which put English Catholics in a terrible position uh, because if they were loyal to the Pope's decree and if they obeyed him, then you know their loyalty to the Queen was completely compromised. So uh, yes, um, Catholic priests were treated not just as um, you know people who had the wrong religion, but as as traitors who were trying to uh, overthrow the state in England. Yeah, I mean, they could die for that as well. Um, you know, we talk about Mary and burning people at the stake, but that was just sort of visually worse than the fate of people who died in prison or were hanged or something. But it, there was there was still a lot of persecution done yes. by the Elizabethan state. Yes, absolutely. Um, although the distinction I would make was that Elizabeth uh, executed, I think, about as many Catholics in her 25 years reign as Mary executed Protestants in just three years. Uh, and also, Mary was executing Protestants just because they were Protestants and she wanted to destroy Protestantism, whereas Elizabeth was executing Catholics more because of the political threat to her throne. Mm. But some of these Puritans also got it. Uh, yes. So uh, the um, mainstream Puritans... Um, you know, were accused of trying to overthrow the Church of England and overthrowing the Queen. And they said, that's just complete nonsense. All we want to do is to reform the church. Um, and the Queen said, well, if you're telling me how to reform my church, then you are opposing me and you're not being loyal subjects. But um, the, the Mayflower Puritans were, were much more radical than the mainstream Puritans. They were inheritors of a tradition which left the Church of England and founded their own separatist churches. And this started because of, um, as I was mentioning earlier, Elizabeth was insisting that everyone wear these robes. Um, and for a while, a lot of parish ministers got away with wearing whatever they wanted to wear because Elizabeth wasn't in a position to enforce it. But when she did start to enforce it towards the end of her first decade, she insisted that every minister had to wear these robes or lose their job. Um, and that was actually imposed on London. And that meant that a significant proportion of London ministers lost their jobs. Um, and most of those just accepted the position they were in and you know gave up their job and found something else to do but there was a radical fringe of this radical fringe of protestants who um who started meeting together in private in houses in pubs in ships in woods and caves and they had their own services and um they had their own baptisms and they appointed their own ministers and uh, first of all all they thought they were doing was having proper services in in private but the longer they did it the more they started to think that they were the true church and the church of england was actually a false church because it had never been properly reformed and it was still half catholic um and yet, yeah, so they started developing all kinds of insanely radical ideas, such as everyone should be free to believe what they want to believe, and the church shouldn't be controlled by the queen, and the church should be controlled not even by the minister, but by the people itself. The, the people in the church should have authority over their own minister, um, which was, you know, very, very different from what was happening in the Church of England. Um, and so, yes, the, the problem for Elizabeth now was that she had Catholics on one side who were refusing to join the Church of England and Protestants on the other side who were so radical that they were leaving the Church of England and founding their own rival churches. Um, I've got a question that's prompted um, by this because it taps into something I'm reading a lot about at the moment, which is um, the current religious state in, in America in terms of um, the battle between, was it founded as a Christ, Christian nation or church and separation of state, what that means. But but the question that's come from what you've said is, wasn't it, you were saying that the Puritans, or at least the general ones, 
were very much government and belief together. There's much of one and the same. So I find it fascinating that how does that link to the future of in, in, in America in terms of the separation of church and state by these very people, or at least, ex, at least versions of them as they evolved? Yes, you're right. The most Puritans completely agreed with with Elizabeth. There has to be one church where everyone is forced to do exactly the same thing and believe the mm. same thing. They just wanted to change what it was that people <laughs> were forced to do. Um, but it was the the separatists who who founded their own churches outside the Church of England um, who believed that the Queen shouldn't control. Uh, what they the true church did um, and they were the ones who got on the mayflower and went first to uh to plymouth and founded the plantation there there were already um english people mm -hmm. in other parts of north america um and so yes that that first uh, colony in new england was um was founded on the separatist principle that the government should have no say in religion and the church should have no authority over the government, no role in government. And that would be quite different to the other Puritans in England who thought you should write. Yes. So it's like a real split of Puritanism here. Yes, yeah. although yeah. You know, that was just one, uh, one colony. And then later, many more Puritans came over from... England in, in later years to establish their own Puritan colonies and they far outnumbered the separatists and so right. uh, so you know they brought with them the idea that there should be uh, a church state and so they tried to found Puritan state churches there in North America uh, so that you know they were what they thought they were doing was taking the Church of England to North America but just you know, on the way over improving it a bit uh, but their problem was that in a country like america if you found a colony uh, and try to impose your version of religion on everyone in the colony if they don't like it they can just leave and go over the hill and found a new colony yeah. uh, and you know found their own church the way they want it uh, and so you very quickly you've got complete freedom of religion because if you don't like the religion you know where you're living then you can just go somewhere else right okay so that that's what the separation mm -hmm. of church and state means then just the the freedom presumably to go and start something else on your own um, yes yeah uh although yeah it, in later years still you had um enlightenment thinkers coming over to north america of course who you know um believed in the separation of church and state from their very different point of view as well so that right. fed, in. well, fed into it okay interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. fascinating great yeah. okay so uh this is a lot of background we've got and getting on to the topic of particularly of theological debate um so who was debating with whom is it uh do they just sort of persecute each other catholic protestant or do they actually try and talk theology to try and work to convince each other a lot that you're right and you're and, you, and they're wrong or whatever is it just a yeah. protestant thing to have this theological debate and try and ha haggle out what's sort of what the truth is no there was plenty of debate between uh, protestants and catholics and between the different kinds of protestants it's just that everyone found it immensely frustrating because they went into these debates thinking you know i know i'm right so I, um you, oh it, my goodness i know i know exactly <laughs> how they feel yeah yeah i know that's exactly how i was thinking I was, I was, I, am i talking about history or am i talking about <laughs> twitter <laughs> um, but yeah it, everyone found it frustrating because they assumed that if they just set out their religion in the right way everyone would realize that it this was right um and then and come around to their point of view um so i suppose that's a, a quite a human trait but there was uh, it was kind of intensified by the by the religious aspect of it that everyone thought well you know my view is not only right but i know it's right because it's what God wrote in the Bible. Um, and I've read the Bible and it's clear, God has clearly communicated his truth to me. Um, and so, you know, all I have to do is tell people what I've read in the Bible and they will understand and agree and believe with me. Um, and obviously that didn't happen. Uh, and people found that quite hard to understand. And so the general assumption was if someone has refused 
to believe what I've told them that God has told me, then they're refusing to believe God. They must have a guilty conscience. They must be a bad person who has decided uh, that they want to live a bad life and therefore is deciding to believe something bad and untrue. Um, and so in this generation, there was there was very a lot of bad attitudes in debate, in debate, a lot of very bad temper because people really assumed that if someone didn't accept the argument that they were in face with, that they were a bad person, uh, which isn't you know completely different to the way people debate today, but you know it was intensified by that, that, that assumption that what I believe is given me by God. Yeah, and what we said before about the whole country needing to believe the right thing for the sake yeah. of everybody. Yes, um, and yeah, I think that as well, as time went by, uh, over the coming generations. Christians did realize that they weren't going to convince each other um, and you know, later generations of Christians started to get their heads around the idea that there are different versions of Christianity and people think differently and believe differently and we are never going to all convince each other so we just have to start learning to live with that and so Christianity embraced pluralism and embrace tolerance because it went into all this assuming that there was only one truth uh, and everyone would eventually accept it and when that didn't happen they had to um had to find a different way to see the problem does that no, mean i'm oh, sorry does that okay. mean that there was a view because different ways of looking at that does that mean that some people some people who go that diversity route uh, of of thought will say actually maybe we're all in the dark and none of us really know we're just trying to get a handle on something or does it mean i tolerate the fact that i think you are totally wrong but i'll tolerate it mm. there's a difference you know yeah um, uh, yeah um when yeah i think um i think that it it was eventually a matter of humility that uh, people realized that although this might seem fundamentally obvious to me um the fact that so many people who you know who i respect as fellow human beings don't see it this way means there are different ways of seeing it mm. um, and uh, and you know people will draw the line somewhere and so you know in the uh, in the 18th century you would have uh, congregationalists who would say you know um, Baptists are okay and Presbyterians are okay but Anglicans are beyond the pale uh, and then as time goes by that, that broadens out and you know these days uh, you know Christians from all kinds of denominations Catholic and Protestant uh, seem to get on together really quite well. So when do you sense this change beginning was it after the enlightenment or even before uh oh before the enlightenment for for sure um you know in individual cases you even see it in um in the time i'm writing about there were so yeah you know, john smith was the first baptist so the this my it, my separatists split away from the Church of England uh, and then the Baptists split away from the separatists while they were in exile in the Netherlands. And, um, and, and John Smith was the leader of that Baptist movement. Um, uh, and, uh, and then they were then split within the Baptist church. And so he started off by denouncing the other Baptists as unchristian uh, and denouncing the other separatists as non-Christians and denouncing the Church of England as non-Christian. And you don't even need to denounce the Catholics as non-Christian. Obviously, they're not Christian. Um, but eventually he got a bit tired of that. Um, and at the end of his life was saying, you know, if someone follows Jesus, then all the other stuff doesn't matter. Uh, um, you know that they've got the heart of it right and the other things uh, we can put to one side um, you know the, that is not the story of the whole society that was just shows what happened to one individual and um, it was you know England ended up fighting a civil war in the 17th century over religion um, uh, uh, and, and Europe had the 30 years war as well and once you've actually gone through 
something as extreme as that over your religious divisions. That was a real catalyst to people realizing we've got to live with each other. Although, you know, it, it, it took a much longer time for people really to, for that to get down into people's hearts. Yeah. Could you talk about some of the practicality of how actually do you undertake a religious debate in Elizabethan England? Uh, yes, yeah, so they uh, they didn't have the internet, um, so they had to find other ways to communicate. Um, and obviously, there was you know, face-to-face conversation, and you know, not so much of that gets recorded. Obviously, although some of it did. Uh, what has survived is much more the writing of books, and this was really restricted in Elizabeth's time. Um, there were some printers in London who had a permit to print and there were no other printing presses allowed in the whole country. Oxford and uh, Cambridge University were allowed printing presses, but they didn't have any. Um, But there were a a, handful of licensed printing presses in London and that was controlled by the state. Um, And so there was, um, you know, real restriction on on who could print what. Um, and you, at this point in time, people were still writing kind of handwritten pamphlets and they would be copied out and they would be passed around. So even without a printing press, that people were writing pamphlets and they would get copied and distributed. Um, but in, uh, in Elizabeth's time, there was a bit of a growth in the kind of um, underground uh, printing um yet there there were people who um (laughs) who would break into printing shops you know um authorized printing shops in the night and try and print their book while the printer was asleep and so printers took to locking up their presses um uh, but people managed to build their own presses and um yeah uh so we know of uh we know of a couple of those where you know people uh, secretly house printing presses in the house, maybe move them from one house to another to avoid detection. Um, uh, and that was obviously all very dangerous. And then also there were some of the separatists who uh, emigrated to the Netherlands where there was a completely unrestricted printing industry. So they were able to write their books and get them printed in the Netherlands and then just like bombard England with propaganda. Although obviously they still had to be smuggled in um, and there were... Uh, you know, there, there was one occasion where a uh, a freight of two thousand books was discovered, um, and they were all burnt, and the people bringing them in were arrested, and um, uh, and there were executions in connection with that. So yeah, it was um, uh, yeah, it was all pretty dangerous, covert stuff. If if you wanted to be on the wrong side of the debate, uh, you know. The other side of the debate yeah. from the queen. It's all debates and discussions, isn't it? <laughs> you can just imagine that thing that we often do with a little angel talking to God, say, "What's going on?" And God say, oh, "I'm keeping out of this one." Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> like Well, that, actually, I was going back a bit. I, that, that did strike me. Yeah. Uh, people, you were saying how people were so frustrated that uh, it was so obvious to them what God thought, and yeah. the, the other side were they ever frustrated with God for not kind of clearing it all up? Yeah, so I was um, my kind of question. If if they were, they they kept it to themselves. Um, nobody talked about God like that uh, at this point in time. It just um, yeah, it wasn't like modern evangelicalism <laughs> with ha- having a quiet time in the morning and hearing the voice of God. Yeah, that kind of. Uh, um, no, um, yeah, it was it was much more kind of respectable than that. Um, you know, people believed that by reading the bible they would you know they would hear the word of god but not generally in a kind of charismatic way although you know my separatists did actually get quite charismatic and they would at their meetings uh, they would like moan and cry oh wow uh, yeah bit of the toronto yeah. blessing going on yes yeah no <laughs> speaking in tongues as, as far as i found but um, uh, right okay yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so yes, yeah, so that was a bit of an aside. The, so you got all these. Tra- sorry, there, for one meeting, there was complaints from a pub at the other side of the road that they were being disturbed by the uh, um, by the Christian meeting happening. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, from a sorry. pub, <laughs> <of> all places. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, 
so you've got all these tracks and books being written by illicitly. Yeah. Um, do you think, I mean, who was reading them? Was it just a tiny minority or were they, were, were the kind of most of the middle classes coming across them? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so the, the stuff that was written by the separatists, um, you, you get the impression that it was incredibly popular, really controversial. Everyone was talking about it. And the same with the stuff that was written by the, the radical Puritans. These people were really notorious. But then, you know, I suppose, you know, again, it's like your, um, your echo chamber, the silo that you live in. You know, the, the writings that tell us about the Puritan movement, about the separatists, they were... They were written by people who were all part of this world and for whom that was everything. And again, if you go up to the farmers in Lancashire and Yorkshire, I'm sure they couldn't care less about it. But yeah, so again, within the metropolitan elite, these things were, you know, uh, were, were passed around uh, and people were converted by them. You know, you had Puritans in the Church of England. Uh, There's a constant stream of them leaving because they read this stuff uh, and they were persuaded by it and then they uh, they left their home and went and moved over to the, the Netherlands so you know that, that's quite a serious price to pay for your conversion so people um, you know uh, people were being properly convinced uh, to change their mind and change their whole way of life. Mm. And how did the authorities respond apart from suppression of, of books? Uh, well this whole thing was was completely illegal separatism itself was completely illegal if you were then going to write about it um, and distribute books that was worse still the the meetings were constantly raided by um uh i was going to say the police the equivalent of the police and then they you know the sheriff's men or the bishop's men or what have you constables um and uh, people were arrested sometimes the meetings were spied upon um, especially in the early days, people were put in prison uh, and then let out. They, you know, there wasn't really such a thing as prison sentences at this time. You would, you'd arrest someone and then put them in prison and decide what to do with them. And if you weren't going to execute them, then you know, before too long, you'd release them. And so people were going in and out of prison all the time with this. Uh, some of them in later years were uh, tortured and... Uh, a few of the leaders of the movement who wrote these notorious books were executed and they were they, they were outlawed and had to leave the country in order to uh, you know a, escape the death penalty um, so it was uh, at the end of Elizabeth's reign and then going into the reign of James the first that the church really started taking the more uh, extreme steps to try and root out Puritanism from the Church of England and to, to root out separatism mm -hmm. from the country and um, so uh, so yes exile for large numbers of people who then would have the, you know, if they'd left property at home they would be confiscated and um uh, and you know just being in prison could quite often be fatal because elizabethan prisons were outlandishly unhealthy places so you know there were martyrs to the movement who were were not executed but you know far more than who were executed just died because they were in prison mm -hmm. Uh, and also, presumably, the um, authorities wrote counter books. They did, yes, um, with varying degrees of success. Uh, Richard Bancroft uh, eventually became the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, and he was uh, a great pamphleteer against uh, against the separatists, against the Puritans in general, and um, he. Um, he, he was a very persuasive writer. He was, he was a very good writer uh, and he had the whole of church history at his fingertips. Um, and he was able to persuade people that separatists were not simply like political criminals, but they were heretics uh, who didn't properly believe Christianity. Um, so uh, you know, that was quite effective. But um, 
And also there were Puritans who remained in the Church of England who were not radical enough to become separatists, who kind of um, managed to ingratiate themselves with the establishment by writing books against the separatists. Uh, and so, you know, some Puritans who would otherwise have been in quite a bit of trouble for their opposition to the Queen were able to make their lives more comfortable by writing against people who were more extreme than they were. Yeah. But uh, I think from memory that the picture is that the more radical and separatist you were, the more fun it was to read, <laughs> read uh, the, the more entertaining the stuff you produced. Yeah, there was um, there was a series of mysterious anonymous tracts which appeared um, in the, uh, the very late 1580s. Uh, going into the 1590s, which really did um, fascinate people and capture people's imagination. They were written by someone who called himself Martin Mar Prelate, which were translators, you know, um, damaged bishops. Um, but yeah, uh, and it, it, he had a secret printing press and these uh, books of his would like, appear from nowhere and everyone was talking about them and everyone wasn't reading them um, and they you know all of the Puritans were very critical of the Church of England he was that but he also had a tremendous amount of fun with the Church of England and so yeah he was uh, hugely disrespectful to the bishops uh, he, he called the Archbishop of Canterbury things like his canterbury or John of Cant um, and he would his books were full of gossip about the bishops he, you know other Puritans denounced the bishops as antichrist but he was the one who would tell tales like um, the Bishop of London swears like lewd swag or uh, an, another bishop his um, his hat was um, stolen by a dog who ran off with it thinking that it was a cheesecake um, yeah, all, all these um, uh, stories about bishops behaving badly um, and just his whole tone of voice it was just so you know, merry and jocular really not what you associate with Puritans uh, at all a very kind of sarcastic um, ironic and he was clearly having a, a great deal of fun being disrespectful to the establishment of the Church of England and it really really offended the bishops and they sent their uh, you know, their squads to you know scour the country trying to find this man in his underground printing press um actually so what, it reminds yeah. me of um, when Francis is talking about going online talking to Christian people of how 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 in fact that kind of spirit of sarcasm and ridicule within with from Christian people is just the same as anyone else politically or not. It's just this, it's almost like this online culture now is like that, but you're saying it's back then when mm, people mm. were making this thing. In other words, it doesn't sound what people would later call Christ-like behavior because it's just all sarcasm and ridicule and mockery. Well, um, I mean, I think that's make me maybe make it sound more harsh. Than right. Yeah, I, you know, if you think more like the tone of private eye talking about the government, that's more like right. More, more oh, political. I see. Not like a sort of troll. <laughs> like uh, these yeah. days we talk about, uh, you know. Uh, yes. Um, it does seem quite interesting the way they do attack each other in that way. Um, yeah. Humorous way. Yeah. So, um, with, with private eye, this, it's got two aims. One is to street, speak the truth to power, as it were, and the other is to have a lot of fun and that sells the magazine. Yeah. So is that sort of dual thing going on that uh, the writer of the, the this book, these books, wanted a high circulation because his ideas were so important, and so he made it as attractive and fun as possible? Um, I think it was... It was more who he was, really, um, in the same way that, um, you know, you know, that's who Ian Hislop is. Um, he's he's a, a merry, jokey kind of person. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the right kind of person to be um, having a, a magazine like Private Eye. I mean, Martin Marprelate was tremendously controversial among Puritans. An awful lot of Puritans would preach against him, saying he's given Puritanism a bad name because he's being so disrespectful mm. to the Church of England. Um, yeah. So um okay. So there were a lot of butt up people who who didn't appreciate this 
Tone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. E- even was, on his side, right? Yeah, okay. it was really. Diverse. I don't like your tone, yeah. sir. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, that's why. well, sort of bringing. I suppose bringing us all into disrepute, making us making yeah. us all look, uh, uh, you know, a bit yeah. uh, like the government here a bit right now. Serious, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly like the government right now in yeah. England. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in all of this, the. Um, all the theological debate didn't, as you were saying, didn't really achieve very much. Uh, it, it, I suppose, except on an individual level, people were com- were convinced and changed sides occasionally. Uh, yes, uh, there, there certainly were people who were convinced, but um, you know, the direction of travel was always into further division rather than to bringing people back together again. Um, so you know. One church would grow, but um, you know, the number of splits that happened in uh, in the Protestant movement in this period is just mind boggling. Yeah. Um, is there yeah. anything you can say about that in the sense that, um, from my understanding, I mean, every every, you know, if it's Islam, Catholic church, everybody's got their sort of in groups and splits. But the official public thing about um, particularly Catholicism is that we you know we're all one and we don't have all these schisms that Protestants have because they split and split and split and split and split. What if, if that's what that's how it looks like. I, I've spoke to Catholics who are vastly different from other Catholics. So they are split, but they're just they're still under the one umbrella where Protestants are almost proud to say, well, we're not them because they're not real. You know, um, what's the source of that within this? This all starts here, doesn't it? Yeah. At this period. Well, yeah, the source of that is in the very source of Protestantism, I think. Um, Martin Luther developed new ideas which were not accepted by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, And, you know, he did that at the background of a time when society was moving from feudalism, which was a... depended on very rigid hierarchical structure where everyone knows their place and keeps Mm. to you know, early capitalism, which is all about the individual choice. So against that background, Martin Luther, um, you know, being told that the church rejects his teaching as heresy, uh, you know, stands on trial at the Diet of Worms and says, Mm. um, I, I cannot... Um, or will not recant or retract anything because my conscience is captive to the word of God and to go against my conscience is neither fair nor is neither uh, right or whatever. Um, Here I stand, I can no other, so help me God, unless I am convicted by conscience, um, by scriptural plain reason, I, I cannot change my mind. So it's all about me and I have to make my decision. Um, and so from that moment, Protestantism was a movement that enshrined the right of the individual to follow their own conscience and to follow their own understanding, to read the Bible for themselves and understand it and interpret it for themselves. Um, and if that's what Protestantism is, then if, I mean, what that could mean is you have this hugely diverse movement where um, everyone thinks something different and that's all fine, a bit like, um, you know, the, the church today. Um, but if you combine that with this age old thousand year old idea that the church is a whole society where everyone is, um, you know, is, is part of the same thing, believing the same thing. Um, then that's very dangerous because you know, Protestantism with its idea of the state church had to uh, try to impose um, uh, and, and force uniformity on people who were inevitably all going in different directions. Um, and once we managed to get rid of that idea of the state church where everyone in the country had to be part of the same religion, then we were able to relax and say, um, yeah, we're all following our own understanding, our own conscience. It's taking us in different directions, and we're cool with that. All right, it's really, yeah. really interesting. Wow. But before we jump out of Elizabethan England, um, I really would like you to tell us a bit about um, a, a couple who were uh, hosting some printing presses for Martin Martel Prelate. Is that what you could... anyway? The the Mister and Mrs Wigston. Can you tell us yeah. about them? 
Yes. So uh, for a long time, the bishops were just um, scratching their heads in bewilderment at uh, who Martin was and where the operation was. But um, they had a lucky break when uh, two of the people working for the press spilt some letters in the street. And that was reported. Um, and so they arrested some interviewed them and managed to find out who had been hosting the press. Uh, they still didn't know who was writing the books, um, but they arrested all the people whose houses the press had been in. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wigston uh, were one of those houses. Um, and so they were tried and all of the other people who arrested <laughs> um, put up the Boris Johnson defense. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so it's, own house. The world is still the same. <laughs> it, 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 it definitely wasn't an illegal printing operation. And if it was an illegal printing operation, I didn't know it was a printing operation. No, no rules were broken. Was <laughs> I didn't know it was illegal. Uh, apart, from, <laughs> apart from Mrs. Wigston, who said, well, I knew exactly what was going on. And it's a good thing too, uh, because Martin Marparella is telling the Queen what's what. Um, and uh, so they were all fined a vast uh, amount of money. <laughs> Mrs. Wigston was uh, fined for, you know, being a criminal. And Mr. Wigston was fined for obeying his wife, the court said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Obeying your wife that that should that shouldn't be a crime that should be a law <laughs> yeah <laughs> amen yeah. make a balance for the reverse in the wedding vows yes. all these years yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so is that the only only time we ever have heard of it a uh, a crime a, a sentence for obeying your wife yeah it's the only time i have yeah um <laughs> but i mean it was, I think it was considered a sin in the Middle Ages. It was called uxoriousness or something like that. Um, you know, a, a man obeying his wife when he was <laughs> supposed to be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess so. In patriarchal society, anything that, that um, undermines the patriarchy is considered absolutely desperately awful. Anyway, um, so... Can we have a bit of context from the whole of church history? Because of your, your, not only are you a comedian, not only are you an expert on Elizabethan Puritanism, you also um, have a book and a stand-up show and everything on the sweep of the whole of church history. Um, and I think it's quite interesting, the debates going on in the sort of two centuries immediately after Jesus, where there was a lot of theological debate going on. It must have yeah. meant, just as much to people as it did in uh, Elizabethan England. And yet somehow they had a slightly better result from it all. You think? Uh, well, <laughs> you, you said how the more they debated, the well, more they come split, up to the some more sort and more of orthodoxy, groups. So-called. And that didn't, yeah. didn't happen in, uh, in these church council era. Um, well, <laughs> there is a way of telling the history of the early church, which is um, that various questions came up and then the bishops came together and they debated it and they decided what was right. And so, you know, the church you know, established what the truth was um, and, you know, taught it and continues to teach it. Um, but I think that's ignoring the... Um, the, for a start, the amount of repression that the the Roman imperial state uh, gave to you know those who disagreed, um, and you know the sheer amount of divisiveness and rancor of those debates, the, uh, and the fact that um, that those who were announced wrong by the councils um you know continued their own churches just you know had to move to avoid persecution so for example the the nicene uh council the first great council as as it's remembered which created the nicene creed um you know so 
that was a result of this very divisive argument between two sides. Uh, the losing side was led by Arius, um, and yeah, so he was got kicked out of the church. Um, but his teaching survived, and so because the you know the Athanasian Orthodox version of Christianity was enshrined in the Roman state, it was then you know tribes that were that were not accepting the Roman Empire throughout Europe who converted to Arius, not unlike in, in British history, how, because we have the Anglican Church of England in England, you have Presbyterianism in Scotland and Wales and Catholicism thriving in Ireland, because if your oppressive imperial state is devoted to one reason, uh, to one religion, that just encourages you to go for heretical versions. Um, and, you know, the, the Nestorian church today in India is a, is a huge branch of Christianity. They call it the Indian Orthodox Church, I think. But that is one of the versions of Christianity that was denounced by these early councils of the church. Um, and yeah, there was tremendous division in Roman society. There was, you know, in the same way as we have um, you know, Celtic and Rangers um, in Scotland with the Protestant and uh, Catholic sides, there were rival uh, chariot racing teams in the Roman Empire uh, with, you know, who were backing the different sides in the, this debate on who Christ was. <laughs> wow. With. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, l looking back, it can look a lot cleaner and tidier than it actually was, I think. Right. And is the language more... Uh, sort of, I don't know, respectful. Uh, you know, St. Nicholas, he became Santa Claus. Uh, he, he punched another bishop in the face at the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, no, I, uh, uh, no one was as, as quite as rude or as scatological as Martin Luther. Um, and um, Wasn't there a lot of anti-Semitism and sort of incredibly, uh, even in the very, very early church uh, against sort of Jewish people in the Jewish background, like Letter of Barnabas and but, but very early on, but then later as well, it got quite vitriolic. Yeah, by um, this point, it was very widespread and very nasty. Yes. In sort of what kind of year span we're talking? Um, I, I'm thinking, what, second, third century sort of thing. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, the, the yeah. councils that we're talking about are in yeah, the that's a bit later, isn't it? Fourth and fifth, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, so already in uh, the second century, there are records that there was a church in Spain that uh, decided it was going to kick out any Christian who ate with a Jew. So wow. you know, already as early as that, you've amazing, got, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's like the reverse of the story in Galatians. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exact, exact reverse story, isn't it? Um, yeah. It really yeah. is. It, yeah, really backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, and mm. then the councils yeah. carried on that. Yeah, but the Jewish Church, which had bent over backwards and to allow Gentiles to become part of it, completely reinvented itself in order to allow gentiles to become part of it they steamed in and kicked out the jews and <laughs> wow, it's incredible isn't it when you see it like that yeah. it's like we'll let you in the door and then they push you out the back <laughs> 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 oh gosh um, yeah um so we've yeah. never been tamed talk about something else yeah I, we've never been tame okay i mean like today we've we've got a lot of good debate going on like with justin briley and um academic debates and stuff but we've also got this sort of trolling side of it all mm. well i'm going to be going online in uh with a new avatar and under a new name i'm going to call myself martin mar prelet or i might <laughs> call myself martina mar, mar prelet <laughs> and uh, and my my secret weapon is going to be sarcasm and, <laughs> and mockery brilliant i'll look out for it yeah. i'm going to go right. under mr stubb <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. i'm going to be mr wigs wigs <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we're playing monopoly or something that's some, some sort of game doesn't it <laughs> it's cluedo. cluedo cluedo sorry sorry cluedo exactly yes 
<laughs> that's what I meant. Clue. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think the, the Reformation period has it's got a lot of resonances with uh, with where we're at now. The fact that um, that it was so divisive, the new thinking. There was, you know, kind of cultural wars that um, you know the new opinions divided people against each other uh, to the extent that they found it incredibly difficult to understand how the other person could possibly disagree with them and how it was wrapped up in identity and also in the new communication technology in the days of the first Protestants. It was the printing press that they were using to, um, you know, to try to propagate their opinions and to uh, to have their arguments um, uh, and the fact that this new technology was available to them made it much more globalized mm. uh, and intense than it would have been if it was just people arguing with their neighbors or other people in the pub. Um, so, it, I mean, it was so, it's so like the internet revolution yeah. has been to us. It must yeah. have been the most extraordinary change in uh, availability of knowledge and information and technology, when you think that prior to that, every single book had to be written out by hand, painstakingly written out by hand. Yes, I, I think it was, it must change the way people's heads work, you know, to live through changes as mm. that, um, in the same way that, you know, I've got no attention span left because of my mobile phone. <laughs> Everything's there. Um, can you say anything on the um, <clears throat> perhaps um, it's a fascinating because I remember when I was at college, this came up in one of the classes, the, the attitude that we can have today looking back at, say, particularly the period of Henry VIII, where the where the Catholic authorities can put to death, you know, heretics from their point of view and then then whoever's in power you can actually put to death i'm, I'm sure it swapped around a few times didn't it <laughs> there was catholics put to death protestants put to death the spirit of the age in terms of the um uh were there were there people rising up in resistance like christian people like particularly puritan ones saying hey this is wrong even if they do believe and they're heretics we don't burn them or kill them um or or was that just the general thing and today we just write books about you or just say you're a heretic but we don't actually do vigilantes or, or have some sort of power to say we would kill them if we if we could <laughs> um. yeah well it was it was these radical protestants you, on in the continent you had the the anabaptists who um were were, were so radical that they thought that they re rejected the whole idea of the state church and that the church should be um for them the church was a voluntary community um yeah which you know completely undermined what everyone thought society was and so that was really fringe stuff but because of that they were able to say you know you don't you don't execute someone because you disagree with them the spirit of christ is to convince someone with words as jesus did and it was the same with the uh, the separatists in mm. england and that's what's kind of won out then, I suppose, in, in general today. You know, the Christianity we grew up with was they're just heretics. We don't go to that church. But back in the day, obviously, because didn't Catholics severely put to death Anabaptists in various circumstances? Like um, even drowning them, I read, you know, just because they believed in well, believers Baptists. Um, Protestants were exactly the, the same because mainstream Protestants, yeah, it was vital to them that the church was a state and the church, the state was a church. And so they rejected Anabaptists every bit as much as Catholic students. So they executed them um, be, because they rebaptized themselves. They were sometimes executed by drowning. As yeah. kind of, you know, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Joke it's, execution. It's just amazing. And uh, yeah. I read somewhere that Luther called them belching dogs and all kinds of things. So there's all this sort of um, whether they, these are sort of uh, things that you can actually find. It's just that I've, that's what I heard um, mm. somebody say at college, actually. Um, but um, but yeah, so isn't it funny? That's the thing I meant, you know, that literally a group of people can say we will drown you 
as an yeah. emphasis on the fact that you are talking about adult baptism, which won out in Protestantism, yeah. except for, say, Anglicanism, perhaps. But um, but well, isn't it interesting? Yeah. They, they were profoundly um, challenging some of the, the most fundamental principles of society and the way that right. it was organised and the way that it worked. And so it was, you know, it was a terrifying threat to people. Um, and so it made sense to kill them. And it was only because society has changed so radically into the kind of society that they were dreaming of. Yes. Um, you know, we are now, you know, the, the church has completely come around to their point of view because we don't have the kind of church that needs to kill people in order to survive. Yes, that's really interesting, isn't it? Just even as a school child, say, learning this, it was saying, then what would they kill them for? You know, well, they, they thought they should go fully under the water and as an adult. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just that when you actually step back, it's like at the time, they couldn't have possibly seen it like that. It was like, what? You know, um, but it's funny, isn't it, how we can evolve even as a human species to think back at that. Yes, it's, um, it's, uh, it is extraordinary how um, uh Protestants and Catholics so most of the time make such common cause and yeah. yet there was a time when believing that the bread literally turned into the body of Christ when the police spoke over it was just it, it was you know it was either absolutely demanded and you deserve to die if you didn't acknowledge that, or it was the other way around, that it was absolutely verboten to think that way, and you deserve to die if you did believe that. Um, the, you know, these, these things can dwindle into being just a question of, yeah, you, you, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato. You know? Yes, it's <laughs> become that. Did, was there anything, Steve, where people... Um... Do you think on mass back then with the cult, like, for example, if, if it if it switched over and suddenly it was like now Catholics are in authority that actually oh, let's, let's get let's become Catholic because the fear of the general, you know, being it, what, in the wrong group. And then if it turned back again, oh, well, let's become in other words, would the people just follow where it's likely to be safe or would they have conviction so strong they couldn't possibly do that? Uh, we certainly that certainly there were people who um, would just uh, who would accept whichever religion they were told to accept. You just go to church and mm. you need to think about it yourself. I mean, there, there were people who would do that in good conscience, and there were plenty of people who just couldn't care less about it and would would do whatever made their lives good. And um, yeah, and there were people who took it seriously enough that they would you know suffer and be dispossessed or uh, maybe even give their lives uh, as you would imagine there's a spectrum of people responses as well to everything that's going on yeah well mm, yeah diverse history great well i think that that's a good place to sort of wind begin to wind down um yes. so steve could you talk us through some of your books Oh, OK. Uh, so this was the most recent one, The Journey to the Mayflower, God's Outlaws and the Invention of Freedom. It was the anniversary of the Mayflower journey in 2020. So it came out just in time for that. 2020 didn't go quite as well as we expected it to in the end, but never mind. Um, uh, what else have we got? Um, a short history of Christianity. I uh, had, you know, I don't know anywhere near enough to write uh, a book on the whole history of Christianity, but I just knew so many people who said, oh, I wish there was a book that would, you know, tell the whole story in one easy to swallow uh, mouthful. Um, so I had a go. Um, I've written biographies of John Wesley, the Methodist founder, um, and William Wilberforce, the abolitionist. And then also of the Clapham sect, which was the, uh, the, the kind of wider group that Wilberforce was part of. Uh, David Livingston. I've written a book called My Ministry Manual to My Ministry. Uh, <coughs> one more time. I've written a book called My Ministry Manual by the Reverend Gerald Ambulance. Um, but that was that was a bit different. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah. about it. <laughs> Great title. By the Apostle Paul. Uh, oh yeah thank you yeah that, that this is all yes uh, a life of paul that was ridiculous because uh, my publisher 
and I was doing a series of books on major figures and periods in church history. And they said, do you want to write one of them? We've got two left. There's the Enlightenment and there's Paul. And I thought, well, Paul's only one person and the Enlightenment is loads of people. So <laughs> okay, for Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, turns out that people have lots of opinions on about Paul. Paul. There's lots of versions of him, isn't there? So <laughs> yeah. Try and suss Paul I had from to read Paul. a few books after all. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, thank you very much, Steve, for that, um, you know, very, very insightful look at a particular period and then a little stretch backwards and a stretch forwards. And um, I hope maybe anybody that's listening will glean a little bit from that. And often these things can be a platform to go away and research, but more. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to go and look at that, try and unpack it with more detail. So that, thank you very much. Well, thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, thanks. Right, You've been thanks. brilliant as ever. So until next time, um, I've been Andrew, your host. And I've been Francis. Uh, I've been Steve. And I'm Mr. Wigston. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye from Mr. Stubb. <laughs> <laughs>